welcome back joining us again today. Um, in this series, we're going to talk a lot about communication with your team, how to communicate, who to communicate to, what problems are out there, things that are going on. And of course, today with the disaster and the pandemic of COVID-19, we have someone here that I think is more than qualified to speak on this, and I really appreciate her doing so. So welcome, Catherine Cheshire, Global Executive Coach and expert on all things communication, at least in my opinion. Welcome, Kat. Hi, thank you, Scott. It's good to be here. So many things are going on today, but before we dive into all that, what I think would be really helpful is outside of a global pandemic and crisis management, can you just give us in your own words and view what your typical world is like, what you do in, in, in normal life, I should, so to say. <laughs> And um, that just give, a, I think it give everybody a little bit of a guidance and for who you are and what you do and then give credence to what we're going to talk about next. Sure. Um, the life before, I, I can't remember what was life like before three or four weeks ago. It's a, it's a whole different time. I have no idea. No. <laughs> My kids don't um, either, by the way. They've completely lost their minds. Right. We've completely assimilated into a new abnormal normal. So. Um, yeah, so, so my work, I work in executive coaching and I work with leaders around the world um, and my typical area of focus um, is emotional intelligence, so building team effectiveness um, using emotional intelligence principles and working with emotional resilience, which I consider to be a foundational competency of uh, leadership, especially um, in the highly uh, changeable, uncertain nature um, of the world that we live in today. Um, of course, the, the level of change and uncertainty that we're going through now is unprecedented. Um, but we as coaches um, and, and leaders around the world, we talk about change on the day to day and the need to be able to pivot and adapt um, and to shift. Um, and so as a coach, I would explore strategies with leaders for uh, being able to show up at their best to do that um, so that they could best lead their teams and best um, remove the hurdles for their teams so that their teams could succeed um, and show up at their best. Um, so that was my day-to-day -day focus, um, working with um, leaders one-to-one, uh, -one, uh, just like you and I are talking now, and, and also with teams in workshop settings as well. Do you find that most of those strategies are built around the growth strategy of a, of a company or just companies mergers and acquisitions or new strategic development rollouts what's the typical scenario is it and is it business focused where the leader of the business is now helping be coached towards what you're you know, where they're trying to go or is it an individual that needs to be coached on how to become a leader in their career because their career is now ascended into this position that maybe they got to too fast or they didn't have all the experience for how, how do you incorporate how's your normal business incorporated well, there's, the answer to that is there's a wide variety. You know, I work with individuals that identify that they want to develop their own leadership brand. They want to show up to be the best they can. Um, in their own companies, a lot of entrepreneurs will be driven um, to develop themselves in, in those ways. Um, the, the organizations that I work with, um, they vary in size but um, and, and stages of growth and being established. But the thing that they have in common is that they identify that it's the team effectiveness, it's the, the, the power of, of how people show up at their best that facilitates results and, and the optimum outcomes. That it's one thing to be well resourced and have a good strategy, but it's, the, it's those organizations that put people strategy first um, that tend to bring in the likes of me um, to work with them and, and especially those that understand the power that emotion has on our decision making and on our approach to working together. Um, so, so really it's a variety of different um, sizes and, and stages of growth of a company that call me in, um, but that one thing that they have in common is that they put people first. Well, that's not surprising, I would say. Well, let's dive right into this crisis that we're in right now. It's obviously a heightened state overall of stress, um, change, um, crisis management, and also opportunity. And I think I like to talk a lot about that because most people don't. And I think too often you're focused on what's happening to you and not what might be happening for you. And that comes from somebody I listen to a lot. Um, mm -hmm. as you know, that phrase, a gentleman named Ed Milat put that thought in my head. You know, everything happens 
for you, not to you. And I think mm. if you really think about things in that way, it makes a huge impact and it's helped me tremendously. Mm. And so obviously we have a lot going at us right now. There's plenty of things that are happening to us and they can all be perceived as bad. And sometimes that filter, I think a normal human nature filter takes in those things in a negative way versus sort of trying to find the positive. Mm. So I don't want to sugarcoat anything, but as a leader and as someone who's coaching leaders, can you tell me a little bit about what your biggest concerns are right now that you're seeing your folks come to you with or you're witnessing mm -hmm. yourself and what you've been telling your clients right now as they go about handling all of these things. Yeah. Well, I, you know, to your point that the, the concerns are wide and varied and of course um, it depends what role that leader is in, if they're, you know, what they're dealing with in terms of how to pivot their business and um, the size of their business and um, you know, how, how long they're able to keep their team on board. Obviously I've had to, I've spoken with a number of leaders that have had to let people go, which has been absolutely devastating. Um, but I think one, so there's, you know, a whole gambit of concerns, but I think one is, hey, what, how, how am my team doing? You know, how can I be there to support my team? How can I be there to help my team? And how can I, as a leader who is dealing with this uncertainty and, and in some cases anxiety and certainly challenge, um, how can I compose myself and be there for my team so that A, I can show up to, at my best, but so that I can support my team through this. So it's not just like, how is my team doing, but how can I show up to be there for my team? That's a big one. And then another area, of course, is how do I communicate um, with my team when I don't have all the answers? And not only do I not have all the answers, but there's streams of information bombarding me at the moment and and things are changing um i don't know how to implement all the changes there's so much uncertainty so it, there's a lot of um managing that uncertainty and getting back to that place of composure so that um leaders are in a position where they can shift the team and get the team to that place where you were talking about which is you know i hear a ton of resilience i hear you being in a place where you're ready to consider the possibilities as opposed to just like coming to terms with what has happened what was and what is um, and so another big issue for leaders of course is that for some of us are um, you know particularly resilient and and even for those of us that are particularly resilient our resilience ebbs and flows so it ebbs and flows for the people in our teams as well so we might be ready to consider the possibilities but where are where are the people that report to us and how do we bridge that gap how do we come together you know, when, when this all happened and right now you're trying to decide, you know, I have this team and mm -hmm. I have revenue projections and I have costs and expenses and some of these things are guaranteed. And then all of a sudden this crisis happens. If you were to think of like, if you're coaching a group of leaders and you said, look, the world just got pushed on pause. The economy for the first time ever has been literally stopped. These are the seven, eight, five, two, however many things you need to be thinking about right now and you need to make decisions on right now. What mm -hmm. are those things? Well, I would, I would invite a collaborative conversation here. I think, you know, that's, that's very exciting. It's a very exciting position that we're in right now in terms of um, many companies are in a position where they're gonna get support from the government to continue those payrolls. And actually, as you said, we're here, we're stopped. What are the things that we wanted to do before that we couldn't do because we're caught in the whirlwind and so some of those things may be coming back to you know the basics of refining all those inefficiencies in our organization that were holding us back before all those problems that we had we saw before how can we we've got them identified right have we got these identified let's move forward on on, on fixing those and, and honing and refining our processes um, i think also really looking to our values as an organization um, how do our values stand up in this crisis and, and where do we want to, and, and how are we going to be ready for the world beyond? What does that world look like beyond? Let's bring together our minds to, to, to think about what that is going to look like and how our values meet what the world's needs are going to be and what our why is and what how we're going to meet those needs. Um, it's a very exciting opportunity right now um, in terms of possibility and um, I don't know that I have all the answers in this call right now. I feel like I would want to be in a room of, of seven or eight other great minds to put that together. 
Let me ask you this question this way. There's two businesses, okay? Well, let's say it's the same business. And it could be any business. It could be construction, could be manufacturing, could be any small business or, or medium or large business. Mm -hmm. Everyone's being impacted the same and this particular business is gonna be have an impact. Both employees, revenue, all the items that are being are being impacted now. One business has a great leader that communicates the right way, gets on the message and does it well. Mm -hmm. And another one has a leader that does it the opposite. They don't do mm -hmm. it well. Tell us in your experience what the business looks like that has a good leader with the right communication on the other mm -hmm. side of this. And what is the business that had poor communication or a not as mm -hmm. not as well prepared leader on the other side of this? What are the what are what do those two companies look like if you have the right and the wrong? Mm, I think, you know, to start with looking at quote the wrong. So if if there isn't clear communication in an organization. As we all know, gossip loves to fill a gap, right? That's the, the famous saying. And so, of course, with that means that you have dueling narratives. Um, you have um, truth and then you have narrative that's spreading around the organization. Um, but with that, you obviously create distrust and disharmony. And we really need to remember that emotions are contagious. So the good communicator, the one who is clear and concise and consistent, um, and shows concern and is showing up is helping model the message and also shape the message um, that the, the, the foundation of how we're communicating so that the emotion is constructive and that, that is what is allowed to spread in the organization. Um, as well, you know, I spoke earlier just a few moments ago about, you know, this, you know, mistrust that can form those organizations that have clear communication, we have a lot more trust. We typically, there's a, there's a lot of different components that go into it, but more psychological safety, where it's safe to speak up, it's safe to um, address behaviors that are not helping. Um, and it's also um, a place where people demonstrate caring and concern. And it's also a place where, you know, it's because it's safe to speak up, it's a, a place where people can share feedback and so we've got this, we've got all the ideas of everybody contributing. So in an organization where that isn't happening and you've got gossip, you've got, you know, stress and, and, and all the, the, the bad behaviors that can follow. And, and then also, of course, resilience impacts and burnout. Um, and of course, the, the, the well-being of individuals is impacted versus an organization where we have clear, concise communication where everybody is aligned. Um, we're um, communicating according to our shared values and, um, and, and it's safe to speak up. And that's where ideas can germinate, where we can um, have disagreements in a safe way. Um, and, and these are generalizations, of course, but where people can thrive and, and typically where their well being um, is better because they're able to show up as their whole selves and, and show up at the best. Makes sense. I, you know, yeah. we, we do, we have a lot of clients that are in the construction field. And one of the things we communicate a lot about is between a subcontractor and a general contractor, sub general contractor and the owner of a project and the mm -hmm. communication tree between all of them. And one of the things that we really focus on is you need to have an open communication <laughs> because what happens and you made this great point and I really want to relate this back to any of our clients that are listening to this or our future customers or anyone in the construction field is communication is so key because if you don't manage the message yourself mm -hmm. I leave something out certainly don't ever lie but you know telling <clears throat> the truth is important but leaving something out that you know to be true is also a form of a lie and mm -hmm. so if you don't communicate a problem or tell someone you're going to be late they're going to fill in the blanks as to why you might be late on a job or why you might be behind schedule with whatever their, their mm -hmm. own perceptions are and if you would just communicate especially in a proactive manner you're mm -hmm. going to have a better result from that other receiving party because they're going to understand why you're late and it might be an acceptable reason not you're late oh and you're late because it must be the same as whatever their previous experience was. And that's not fair mm -hmm. to you, but it's really your fault if you don't communicate it correctly. Right. And I want to make sure that our construction folks hear that because I think that's such a problem in the construction mm -hmm. world is everyone has these perceptions to start with. 
and there's such a struggle sometimes over power, sometimes over communication. That I think just in an open, what I heard you say is like have a consistent message, communicate mm -hmm. it, be honest, be fair, create that dialogue so that you can have a fair conversation. I mean, there's nothing perfect about a construction site or job. Mm -hmm. There's nothing perfect about anything. But the one thing about the ebbs and flows and changes of it is always consistent. And if you just mm -hmm. communicate those changes in advance and create an environment where you can speak freely to both people and no one has to fill in the blanks with gossip or their own perceptions, really could save everybody a lot of anxiety and stress and time. Yeah, I think, you know, to your point, it can save a lot of anxiety and stress. I think it can have practical impacts and emotional impacts. So, you know, people will respond to low information in different ways. And what you might find is if you're not managing the message that you're going to have people that respond with overfunctioning and maybe create action that is the antithesis or the opposite of what you want um, and, and creates a derailing of a whole different kind in, a, in, in even the best intentioned ways. Um, that alignment, it really comes from the communication at the top. And to your point about the subcontractors, the supervisors, all those different levels, you need the, the refinement of the message. You need it to be consistent among all those groups. So you really need to make sure that um, you're, you're having aligned conversation with those people who are, who are speaking day to day with your, te your wider teams as well. Make sure that that message is consistent. You know, on that note, how, how do you recommend communicating a message that's going to be negative? Maybe it's a leader terminating an employee, but it could also be an owner of a subcontracting business communicating to their general contractor that they're not going to be on time or something that they thought was going to happen this week is going to be pushed off a week and it's going to be a bad, it's going to be bad for the project. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how do you recommend like that? the management and execution of that tough conversation or, or message. One thing I like to do actually with all messaging is think about what is the essence that I want to bring across here. And I think that first thing is, is really back to your values and making sure that that essence rings true, especially when you are delivering a tough message. So it might be a very simple thing like um, being genuine or being of service or being authentic, like whatever it is that is fundamental, just, say that to yourself before you even say the message just to keep you in line with your values because if you know if you're feeling uncomfortable about sharing a, a difficult message um mm. it's easy to to cop out or it's easy in that moment of discomfort to uh, maybe not present in line with those values and and you don't want to do that so i think first of all like really think about the values that you want to make sure stay true and so that's really about the essence um, I think when it comes to talking about difficult things, um, it can really help to just open and say, this is really difficult to share this information with you. Um, but I'm sharing this information because it's important that we're transparent and clear, um, what, you know, or, or whatever the value point is. Um, so I think starting there and then sharing the information in a way that is informing um, and um, with care and concern um, and it's certainly not like trying to manage a situation, right? And so go in with that spirit of being, of informing and caring and collaborating. I, I can't remember exactly how you stated it, but what I heard was don't manufacture the conversation. You know, like- Manage, you know, yeah. You know, don't mm. manage it, you know, just yeah. get to it, but explain why. And I, I think it's a great point you made in front. It's just, isn't it simply saying, look, this is really hard for me to tell you, but it's important, so I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And then get to it because, Nobody likes the cliffhanger either. You know, get to the point, tell them that you don't point. get to it. We've written a lot about um, vulnerability before. Mm -hmm. and I think we're touching in that realm now, you know, like not, not every time someone is right and someone is, is wrong necessarily. Um, mm -hmm. But you need to accept responsibility for the portions of it that are yours. And so mm -hmm. how do you incorporate being vulnerable into a business communication or conversation that, in your mind, whether it's conflict management or if it's even just communicating a tough message? Well, I think at first it really helps with vulnerability to um, start with a bit of self-compassion um, because you don't just want to jump straight into, right, everyone's telling me I'm going to, you know, being vulnerable is good. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to be vulnerable. And I think, you know, you, you want to do it in a way that um, is, is within your, 
your self limits. Um, so I think starting with being um, self compassionate. And I think also, here's the other thing we don't necessarily talk a lot about with vulnerability, but I just want to bring in the word selective vulnerability. Um, I think most of us have a sense of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. And so, you know, you mentioned there like different business communications. Well, there's so many different kinds of business communications. So, and, and what's appropriate and what isn't. So, um, when we talk about vulnerability, it's 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 selective, right? You're gonna you're gonna choose what you're vulnerable about. But we do want to model by naming emotions, and I think when leaders are able to do that, to show that self awareness of um, the emotions that they have, and to name them, and to show that they're normal and that's okay, and and in fact you can be a a high ranking leader and have those emotions, um, then then that's very powerful. You know, vulnerability is one of those things that it has a different definition. I think what you brought up about being selective regarding it is important. You don't want to just run around and tell everybody something about yourself just so you can make a point. I mean, that's that's kind right. of fake. But being vulnerable about the scenario or the situation in the sense that you understand both sides because you might have been in that position before and you can yeah. share an experience so you're not trying mm -hmm. to come from a, a perch of knowledge that you know you're here and someone else is below or beneath you yeah, um, it really. might be a scenario that you're in today for whatever reason but it doesn't mean that you don't have understanding or empathy towards that role because it could have easily happened you could have easily been on the other side yeah and if i think of the leaders that have had the most impact on me they're the ones that have shared with me their experiences and particularly their mistakes um areas that they've tripped and areas mm -hmm. that have been hard for them because um, mistakes are inevitable and conflict is inevitable for all of us. So, um, so yeah, to your point there, I think those leaders that are able to talk about those things in a way that's helpful to the person they're speaking to have a profound impact and, and to your point, humility. What, one thing I'd love for you to be able to do, I think everybody listening to this can take from this, is a lot of people struggle with how do you let somebody go? You know, you're close mm -hmm. with your team. You know, if somebody does something horrible, it's still hard to let them go at times because you know you're going to be impacting them. Um, it's even more difficult in times like this where you may be having to let people go that you don't want to let go. It's just, right. you just have to make those decisions. What is the best way to communicate the separation between yourself and, and another employer or someone that's leaving your team? You know, the, the, the first thing is to, is to come back to back to what I said earlier about making sure these values are intact, you know, these values of care and concern um, and wanting to do your best for this person. How is it you need to show up for this person right now? I think, you know, I've been in a position where I've had to let people go and everybody in the room knows that it's an uncomfortable and difficult conversation. So I think it's okay to start by saying, we need to have a difficult conversation. And they might even know what, what it's going to be. In your first example, it's somebody who um, there might be some reasons why they're being let go. My assumption is in a, in a, a well-organized organization that it's not going to be a surprise to them that they're being let go. There's probably been a series of um, actions, disciplinary actions and reviews and feedback that has led to this moment. So in these conversations, it's like, OK, we're at this point where we've got to have this difficult conversation. Um, I think in your other example where we're talking about letting go of people that you don't want to let go, then it's, um, it's a very human conversation. It's okay to say that, you know, it's okay to say, you know, I, this is the absolute last thing that we want to do, but what we do want to do is support you. And so in that conversation to have everything ready, making sure that you're removing hurdles for this individual so that they have all the resources that they need um, in one place, even if it's a one sheet, um, and if you're in a position to offer outplacement services and things like that, that help them transition into their next role. Um, and also, if you're in a position to say that we want to hire you back, if we're able to, then, you know, you obviously cannot make any promises, but whatever things you know to be true to share those things and, and then to get their feedback just don't deliver the information and send them on their way like have a conversation and have a human conversation how quickly in the conversation do you recommend getting right to the point like you know this is going to be a difficult conversation like you said however do you go right into it like today will be your last day here i mean because sometimes it's that punchline everyone waits for and and i've had advice given to me before someone said look scott 
in these in these environments, as soon as you tell somebody it's over, they're not going to hear anything else for the most part. They're either too overwhelmed or the me message is there. So just right. get to it, get to the point, and be clear about it because the rest of it is just going to be a little bit noise for different reasons. Some people be mad, some people be sad, but. So do you have a recommendation on how quickly you get to the main point? My immediate reflex to that is very black and white. And that is it. If you're having an exit conversation, that that is the only topic of that conversation. Um, and I actually um, spoke with somebody a few weeks ago who was let go after a 45 minute meeting where they talked about the operations of the company. <laughs> and they, they, they talked about this and that and what needed to happen. And they said, oh, and by the way, I just heard from this person I have to let you go today. And they tacked it on to the end of a regular business meeting. That's terrible. Which, right. And of course, how did the person feel? Um, I, 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 I believe that that kind of conversation is the print exit conversation is the only topic. This is about concern and, and bringing things to a human level um, and not about operational efficiency in this moment. This is about doing the right thing by this person. From a frequency perspective, getting back into where we are now, we're dealing with this pandemic, there's a lot of moving parts. What do you recommend the cadence, the frequency, the type, amount of communication to have with your team? Lots, <laughs> more than you think. <laughs> They'll let you know if it's too much, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, just to state the intention, it's like I intend to communicate perhaps to the point where it's too much and if it's too much i know you'll let me know um i think the other thing that i touched on earlier was about being consistent and i think it's really great if you can say you know what you can expect updates from me at 10 o'clock on fridays you know we'll have a town hall or a zoom town hall or whatever it is or, um, and um and in that time you know what they can expect from the conversation if it's possible i'm a big fan of sending agendas out in advance um, so that you can at least give people a heads up about what's going to be discussed because people might have questions that aren't quite formulated yet and if you give them an agenda it gives them the opportunity to speak up in real time and get some real time feedback you know emotional intelligence is one of those words that i always hear or phrases i always hear that you know it sounds great but I, and i think my audience may wonder or our audience today may mm -hmm. wonder what do you mean what is emotional intelligence what does that actually mean me you know, what does that mean in my business world is that the same when i'm talking to my spouse or my children or is it different in a business setting and i'd love from a business perspective for you to sort of clarify that and help make some more specific points to it yeah you know i think sometimes um people think of emotional intelligence as i've heard it quoted as being the soft stuff the touchy feely stuff there's a um, a tool I use called Team Emotional Intelligence, and the researchers behind that found that emotional intelligence um, norms, so behaviors that are associated with emotional intelligence, account for about 25% of the variance in performance, i.e. they're really important for a well-performing um, team. And what is emotional intelligence? It's awareness of our own emotions. So. The, the, the responses that we have to day-to-day -to -day life and also the, the awareness of others. And so um, team emotional intelligence is just so important, of course, because there's that self-awareness point of understanding how we feel about things and how we respond to things, understanding our triggers, understanding our strengths as well, um, and then understanding how others respond to um, events around them. Um, and so that we can show up and support our team members um, in a way that allows us all to show up at our best, which I know I keep saying is showing up at our best. So I think emotional intelligence is a fundamental uh, part of how teams um, deliver beyond those meeting processes and fundamentals, right? There's those fundamentals that we need to be a, a well-performing team. And then emotional intelligence norms are really important Funda 20, to the point of 25% uh, uh, performance variance, as I mentioned before. You, you hit the nail on the head when you said awareness. To me, emotional intelligence is, are you aware? Are you really yes. listening, hearing, paying attention? Tuning in. Yes. Kat, is there anything <laughs> that I should have asked you that I have not today that you think is really relevant to what we've talked about? One thing we didn't address that I think would be helpful to address is, is recognizing in your team the strengths they have 
that they're bringing every day and to highlight the specific impact those strengths are having on the success of the, how the team is operating right now in these unprecedented uh, times. Um, think about you know, how you can communicate that um, and think about how your team like to receive that feedback too. Some people are very private, some people like to be publicly recognized. Um, recently I was with a team where we shared an email where we took each person in that team and we were very, very thoughtful about the specific contribution and strength that they had brought and the impact that it had had on operations, people, um, the outcomes. Um, and so I think that's really important. And I think, you know, the other thing is really, um, back to your point about, you know, we were talking about self-awareness, thinking as a leader, think about the resilience of your team and be aware that it's going to ebb and flow. And, and, and to think about how can I um, support my own resilience so that I can show up with composure and, and show up with concern and show up in a way that really supports the team that are working for me. And what do I need as an individual too? I think you make a great point there, recognizing each individual, I made a note, recognizing the team's strengths each day and that person in particular, and most importantly, how that strength, their strength is tying to the performance and impact that it's having. Whether it's today mm -hmm. in a bad situation or a tough environment, or even if it's just in a great environment where you're wildly successful, tying their strengths to why we're all wildly successful in one cohesive unit, or maybe just individually is, is important. I do agree with that. And I don't think yeah. it's something I'm aware of and I try to pay attention to, but I don't do it enough either. I think, you know, a lot of us don't, um, or a lot of us have really good intentions. And of course, with the whirlwinds, um, time goes by. And then, of course, we're surprised at just how much time has gone by um, before we're giving that recognition. And, and, you know, in some organizations, we might have easy ways to give feedback, like tacos and, you know, kudos points and all those things. Um, but are we doing it in a meaningful way? And, and I think it's really, as a leader, if we can put that in our um, to-do list, not so that it's like some task that you have to do, something that's meaningful, um, because A, it gives people the feedback to keep doing more of what they're doing, to dial up their strengths, and it also emphasizes what your organizational values are, right? You're, 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 you're highlighting the mission and you're highlighting what you want to accomplish and what you want more of. Um, and something we didn't really touch on that I think is really important is naming. Naming emotions and naming uh, behaviors and choices that we want to see more of so that those, um, so it's normal to talk about them. Uh, that's another thing that I think is really helpful um, for an organization looking to uh, just norm talking about emotions in general too. There's also an opportunity to do that with feedback. Is there any specific ways that you would recommend or action steps next that uh, a business owner should take from here? I think I touched a little bit on them a few minutes ago. I think it's that, you know, as a leader, really delve into your own self-awareness about how you're showing up um, and how that's helping uh, or hindering your team or, you know, worse, even hurting. So make sure that you're, you know, self-aware and able to show up in a way that's bringing out the best. Um, and I think, you know, we've touched on it too, is communication. The next action step for uh, a leader is to do a quick audit of how you're communicating uh, throughout your teams and how that information is, is being disseminated through the teams and reinforced. So get your supervisors or your different levels on the same page, support those supervisors um, in getting that message on point. Um, and, and again, bring that communication back to informing and caring, not trying to manage. And I think we also have a really good opportunity here as organizations as another action step or as a third action step to really take well-being very seriously, um, in the team, uh, and emotional awareness and, and have a look at on an organizational level, um, what uh, policies and procedures you have in place, um, how you reinforce the importance of well-being, um, is it in your onboarding practices, um, are your supervisors tapped into well-being um, and checking in on the team and how everyone is doing as well. In the construction world and specifically, there's a lot of mental health issues. I quite frankly think there's probably more mental health issues in any area um, than, there, than we may think there is. If we're talking about drug dependency, suicide, depression, and you're a business owner, how, what kind of ways can you create an environment to have that 
your work environment, your company that you work for be a support system or a, or a pathway to help versus a stressor for someone who is depressed? You know, that, that, that sort of feeds back to those organizational norms where you, you really want to consult with uh, mental health professionals on, on that to make sure your, your policies and procedures are, are there to support folks who are having mental health challenges. I think um, obviously having resources uh, made available and, and very clearly communicated is very important. So um, it can be really um, powerful, especially if you're thinking about your communication strategy to think about, okay, do my team know about our employee, employee assistance program, assuming that your organization has one? Are hotline numbers available? Um, are they put in places where employees will see them? And those supervisors, those folks that are working with, with people, it's a great opportunity to, to have them train on things like reflective listening and, um, and, and awareness and what to look out for and how to, how to create an environment that is psychologically safe so that somebody might speak up um, as well. Catherine, I really appreciate your time today. This has been very, very helpful. Um, I hope it's beneficial to everyone else too. And I really want to thank you. So too. It's been a real pleasure and uh, thank you for having me um, and I just wish everybody the best during this challenging time. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to listen and go through this with us and hopefully you found this to be beneficial and good for your business, yourselves individually and even your teams. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day everybody.